All right, guys, well, today there's going to be a bit of a departure in my typical blog style. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about something different. So stick around. All right, guys, so today I want to talk about a bug that I've had, and I've been working on it for a couple of weeks now. And, uh, you know, with the inflation hellhole that uh, our country has become, I wanted to jump on the e bike bandwagon. And, uh, you know, these are becoming fairly popular. And I figure, you know, if I start commuting, summer's coming up. So if I start commuting to work, uh, I'm going to stand to save quite a bit of money and not have to make a lot of investment into it. So the amount of money I save, I think, will more than make up for the cost of this project. And now I was faced with the question, should I build a bike or should I buy one? And I started doing a lot of research on the pros and cons of building versus buying. And uh, I'm not going to get into that in this video. There's plenty of research you can do on your own for that. Um, but I will say that I decided to build. And once I got to that point, then I had to decide, do I want to... Um, build from scratch or do I want to upgrade a donor bike as they call it? Well, that's the big question. So again, after much research, I decided that I was going to go ahead and buy a bike and use that as the framework. I started looking at, you know, what I could buy on Craigslist, what kind of prices um, I was looking at, you know, and then I thought if I was going to buy a frame and build it entirely from scratch, I wasn't, you know, the, the cost was still too high to get a new frame. So after a lot of research, I started to go down the rabbit hole of, uh, you know, the Schwinn and Mongoose bikes from Walmart, who, again, there's plenty of information on this, but Schwinn and Mongoose have been making major strides up in their game over the past couple of years. Something happened within these companies that uh, really made them start to take notice and, you know, make people want to buy more of those bikes. And they've been incorporating some fantastic features uh, now again, I'm not I'm not glorifying the bikes at all. I mean the bikes still um, they're they're largely crap bikes, but it's because of the components on them. The frames on these bikes are fantastic, and you know again there's there's a lot of people uh, that you'll find if you just search YouTube. You'll you'll find a lot of people that are doing these uh, upgrades to the bikes because they found it's more economical for them to buy parts that they want on the bike and put those on. And, you know, as long as you have a good foundation to start with, and the frame of the bicycle is a good foundation. And I'm going to go into why I selected the Schwinn boundary as my foundation for the e-bike project. And um, let's get into that now. So I'm going to leave a description, or down in the description, I'm going to leave uh, my parts list of what I went with. Now, keep in mind that I've been a cyclist for many years, and I have quite a few bicycles. So... Um, not all of these components I had to actually buy. They were just in my parts stash. So um, I chose to upgrade everything on the bike with the exception of the frame and the wheels. Those are really the only original parts on the bike right now. Uh, everything else has been swapped out. Everything. Um, and the end result is a fantastic bike. Uh, but I'm going to go into that again. If you choose to take this path and take, the, take on this, uh, this challenge then um, you you probably don't need to upgrade everything. You know, a lot of the stuff that I did was for weight savings. Um, but so anyway, I'm going to go into those components. And again, in the you'll see the, the cost list and the parts list in the description. So if you want to refer back to that, you don't have to scroll through the video or anything. Um, but my total cost in this project was $1,350 roughly. Uh, that was, again, the total cost of all the parts that I upgraded. And that is including the cost of the bike, which the, the Schwinn Boundary you can pick up for $300. Actually, like $298. And sometimes it goes on sale for less. Uh, so I had several factors that I was looking at. I wanted to stay in the 29er uh, realm. I wanted to stay with 29-inch wheels. So that, you know, other than that, I was thinking of going with the Schwinn Aluminum Comp. Uh, which is a 27 and a half, but I thought, no, as a commuter, I'm building this bike out to be a commuter. I'm not building it out to be a 
mountain bike. So I thought that the 29 inch wheels would be better for commuting. They'd handle bumps in the road and things a little bit better. Uh, and also I'm a taller guy, so the taller bike actually works well for me. Um, so that's, that's why I, one of the reasons I went with that. Um, but that was my theory behind it. Now, I, if you were to compare the power output uh, and the quality of parts that I put on this versus what you can get in a in a pre-built bike at the cost of $1,350. I think you have to agree that you're getting much more power, much more range out of the battery, and just everything about it is more solid, you know, just a better bike in general than what you could actually just buy for that cost. So, and I'm going to go into that now. Um, so, let's first talk about why do I think that this bike is the absolutely brilliant candidate for an e-bike upgrade. There's certain things about this particular bike that just make it very, you know, amenable to, to this upgrade. And so some of those factors I'm, I'm gonna go into and I'll put up some pictures to illustrate what I'm talking about. But uh, the first thing is it's a modern geometry. You know, a lot of bikes that you buy, you, you, you get what's called a donor bike. That's what they refer to these bikes, is a donor bike. Um, you know, that may be something you picked up off Craigslist, something that somebody gave you, or maybe you had an old bike in the garage, you know, and you just wanted to upgrade that to an e-bike. You know, that's your donor bike. But when you buy something like the Schwinn Boundary, over the past couple of years, they've actually updated the geometry to make it, you know, it doesn't look at all cheap, and it doesn't look outdated. The geometry is very good, um, you know, with the slack head tube angle and all. Um, so it, it, you get, you're getting into a modern bike. Uh, that, that's what I like about it. Now, another factor of this frame uh, is the tapered head tube. Now, I'm not going to go into the details because I think there's a that's just covered in a hundred other videos that you can find. If you want to find out what the benefit of a tapered head tube is, um, you know, and if you're into biking, you know what the benefit of that is, is that, you know, a tapered head tube is something that people for years have said, well, that's never going to end up on a uh, big box bike. You know, they, they didn't think that was ever going to happen. Well, guess what? Both Mongoose and Schwinn managed to start doing that on these newer models. And that is impressive at the price points they're putting out because it really increases your ability, you know, to, to mix and match components. And, you know, you're not limited in certain things there. It's really fantastic, um, you know, feature to have on a bike. So that's another one. Another great feature about this particular bike that other bikes don't have is that the down tube of the frame is actually a square profile. It's kind of squarish. It does have rounded corners on it, but it's a squarish profile. And the reason that's important is that, you know, when you go to mount the battery onto the frame, you're supposed to pick up the water bottle holder holes, right? And it's just those two holes that hold that big battery on unless you do something else to improve the stability of it. Um, now on this frame with the square profile, it gives you a much better base for that big battery to, you know, be stable on. And it gives, you know, when you, when you bolt it on, I found that it just creates a fantastic platform to do that. Now on this particular frame, I did have to drill new holes. I'm going to get into that later, but right now I want to focus on the, the positives of uh, the frame. So that's that's another feature, is that square profile. Um, another great feature is that it's already equipped with 160 millimeter disc brakes. Okay, and that's um, fantastic. Now, they're not hydraulic, they're mechanical. So that's, that's, you know, you may not like that, but I will say that these mechanical brakes did actually stop the bike fairly well. Now I did still end up upgrading them because I had, you know, the, the hydraulic upgrades available. Um, and I'm going to go into those components, but, uh, you know, that's, that's another benefit is that you're already on, on disc brakes with this model and you're, it, it's going to stop the bike a lot better. Uh, next is that it, the bottom bracket is already appropriately sized for the most widely available sizes of motors. Okay, uh, most motors, uh, in order to fit as many bikes as possible, they're made to fit the standard BSA type bottom bracket. You know, which is you know the the widths of that are from 68 millimeter to 73 millimeter. There's a little five millimeter range in there. Uh, you know, between the different versions, but those are the most common types of bottom brackets on the most wide-ranging, 
ages of bicycles. And so it's a lot easier to find a motor in stock that will fit that. <laughs> you know, when you start getting up into the BB86, BB90, some of these wider bottom brackets of the higher end bikes, uh, it's those those motors that will fit that width are not quite as widely available. So it's an, that's another benefit in my mind is is that it does have the 73 millimeter bottom bracket. So um, it extends your options there. Another cool thing about the bike is there's cable lugs that are pre-installed under the down tube, and that was very helpful uh, in being able to come up with some clean wiring. This is, you know, these are this is a really great feature, you know, that they're already installed there. So that's that's uh, another benefit. Uh, also, while we're talking about under the down tube, uh, actually under the bottom bracket, there's no cable raceways to get in the way. Now, in other videos that I've seen when they're doing these upgrades, when they try to slide the motor into the bottom bracket, there's usually some cable raceways for your derailers and things that go under the bottom bracket and they go through these little channels that, that are bolted uh, you know, under that bottom bracket and they get in the way and people have had to get creative with cutting those off or moving them and you know, you know, that extends your amount of hours in trying to get this upgrade done. So on this model of bike, don't even have to worry about it. The, the shifter uh, cable, the derailleur cable, actually runs under the top tube and then down the seat stay. So it's entirely out of the way of anything that you need to do on this upgrade. So it saves, it's a, it's a time saver. So that's one of the great things about it as well. Now, um, other than that, other benefits are that this is a very rugged frame. You know, when you strip all the parts off of it, that frame does not feel cheap. It feels rugged. It feels like a good mountain bike frame. I don't see any problems with the longevity of it at all, you know, and being able to take some abuse and take the extra weight of the motors and things that you're going to end up doing with this bike. So, um, and then of course, one of the biggest benefits of using this bike is that, you know, you can get it for under 300 bucks, you know, <laughs> so that's, that's the elephant in the room there. Now let's talk about the cons. What are the gotchas? If you're going to use this bike, what did I learn? You know, what were my lessons learned from this um, that might benefit you? Um, one of the big unfortunate things is that if you look at where the water bottle mounts on the original bike frame, uh, it's very low. And especially with some batteries that might work, you might be able to access those holes. But on the battery that I picked, uh, the mounting holes are at the top of the battery, and so there was no way to mount the battery into those holes. So I ended up having to drill new holes into that frame, you know, with with the threaded inserts. And so that's another gotcha with this, is that you're going to need to make sure you have a nutsert tool. Now, I purchased one from Harbor Freight, the Doyle. It's a whole kit. It comes with everything you need, and it actually has the 5 millimeter uh, thread size already in the kit. Now, it's an expensive kit. You know, I think it was uh, close to 50 bucks. Um, but again, as far as tools go, that's it's a good tool. It, the, the inserts installed flawlessly, uh, no problem there. I, I don't have any problems with thinking that, you know, it's not going to be able to hold that battery up. So I did have to drill those new holes, um, but, you know, the, the threaded insert tool made it a successful job. So that's another downfall. Um, the, bike, the bike is actually very heavy to begin with, and that's because of the components on there. It has very low quality components. Again, one of the major downfalls to buying the bike. But if you plan to upgrade those, again, it doesn't cost a lot to upgrade those components. It doesn't cost a lot at all. Uh, the, the components are, you know, like, for example, the handlebar is steel. Uh, I saved half the weight of the handlebar by going to an aluminum bar. Uh, same thing with the seat post, steel. So all that stuff got ditched. Uh, the fork is the major offender there. The fork is seven pounds by itself. Uh, and by going with the ZTZ fork, which was a magnesium alloy lower um, on that construction, cut the weight of the fork by more than half. I think it's like 3.7 pounds or something. It, it's, it's just so much lighter uh, and better of a fork than what comes on the bike. So that's one of the best upgrades that you can do on this bike is getting rid of that fork. Um, 
Now, one of the biggest downfalls about using a bike like this is that, and you've, you've probably heard the horror stories, that when you get a big box bike, they're not professional bike people assembling these things, in a lot of cases in the stores. Um, and so you're going to run into those quality control issues with this bike, as I did. <laughs> I ran into some big issues on my particular bike. I'm not saying that if you buy the bike in general, everybody's gonna have these issues, but um, some of those issues I'll go into to in depth. The first being uh, removing the crank. The non-drive side of the crank was basically welded onto the axle, uh, the crank axle. And it's got that square taper uh, I could not get that thing off. I ended up having to take uh, reciprocating saw, an oscillating tool, crowbars, in order to get that off. And you know, this this happens on the square taper. It's it's a thing. You know, the, these guys that are assembling it sometimes they assemble things so tight, and there's they're not cleaning surfaces and they're not greasing them when they assemble them together. And I, that thing was just welded on. So that added three hours to my upgrade project just cutting that thing off I, I literally had to cut it off in order to get it out of there so, so that's you know those quality control issues that was one there was also this one uh the headset bearing um and i re i heard uh over on Ke uh, kev central who has a very popular walmart bike kind of upgrade channel um he ran into the exact same problem on his schwinn aluminum comp uh, where he noticed a rattle in the down tube, and he found out when he disassembled the uh, the headset, he found this exactly what I had going on. Uh, you see that you know somewhere in shipment the headset the you know the the neck wasn't in there quite right, and it, it got crushed in you know in shipment somehow. One of the bearings fell out and was rattling around. So I had the exact same problem on this bike. Um, you know, which means that, okay, well, clearly I'm going to have to upgrade the headset. And I went with the Jessica model headset, which I'm not complaining about that because the Jessica headset is fantastic. I'm I'm going to be putting that on all my bikes. That That's such a great headset. There's, there's a lot of reasons for it. But again, there's, you know, there's other people that kind of cover that. Um, let's see, what else did I run into? Quality control. Oh, and then there was this. There was the, uh, on the back wheel, there, I was getting a grinding noise. Whenever it, the wheel would coast, I was getting a grinding noise out of the back wheel. And it was very annoying. Um, you know, it, I'm like, it shouldn't be grinding like that. I said, well, maybe it just needs grease. Maybe it, you know, needs to break in. So I disassembled the wheel and I found that the bearing capture nut that you see here, um, it's not true. It, it's not even, you know, if you spin it, I mean, it's a good eighth of an inch out and that's just a small little capture on there, you know, and, and that's all this nut does is it just holds the bearings in place. It doesn't really put a lot of pressure on the bearings. It just keeps them in place to make sure that they're, they're rolling properly. Well, with that nut being, you know, so far out of whack and so far out of true that it was just creating this God awful uh, grinding noise in the back wheel. Well, anyway, I had to fix that by doing some custom machining. And you can see here that I did a, a custom a uh, little spacer in there that actually now holds that bearing capture, you know, where it needs to be. So I, I, I had to turn that on a lathe. Granted, I, and again, I'm not saying everybody's going to run into this. I, I haven't heard of anybody else having that problem, but I had it. And I think it was probably just due to somebody, you know, unskilled assemblers is what I attribute it to. Anyway, those are some of the problems that you really run into with this. Um, Another problem I had was that the 48 tooth chain ring that came with my motor, now I could have ordered a different size chain ring, but I wasn't sure. I, I started thinking, well, 48, doing the calculations in my mind, that's the, the size of ring that I wanted in order to get the, the speed and power ratio out of, out of a single chain ring that I wanted. So I went with a 48 tooth. That was a bad decision on this particular frame because it's too big. And you can see here that, you know, it, it, I had to create a 90 thousandths inch shim that I turned on the lathe in order to gap out that chain ring to make sure it didn't rub against the frame. Um, I have a 42 tooth chain ring that I think is gonna solve the problem. Um, but having said that, even though I had to gap it out, it throws my chain line off, but I've not experienced any chain drops or anything in the time that I've been riding it. Haven't experienced any of that. It, and the wheel's been running great. Everything's been, been running really solid on it. The Bafang motor, very quiet. Um, 
man, I, I, I am really excited about this project. I consider it to be a great success. Uh, you know, and guys, if I can answer any questions for you um, regarding this, because here's the deal is that I haven't heard of any, with all the videos on YouTube and all the, the vloggers that are covering this model of bike, I have not found a single one that has chosen it as an e-bike upgrade. And I'm sure people, that's got to be going through people's minds, um, you know, what makes them choose the frames that they did. And, you know, I, again, I think that even with the challenges that I ran into, I don't think everybody's going to run into those. And the chances are slim that you probably will. Uh, but, you know, like I said, I mean, it is a big box bike. They're not assembled by professional bike people. You just got to be expecting them. You know, some things are not going to be tight. You know, some things are going to be overly tight, <laughs> you know, um, that, that's just that's just the name of the game, you know, and, and like I said, I don't shy away from it. I've, I've got plenty of tools and things to work on these projects with, but, um, you know, that's my experience with it. I think that, you know, the Schwinn frame and this bike makes an excellent, excellent base, you know, that if you have the parts, I mean, you can probably do this upgrade in, in three hours, um, you know, unless you run into the challenges that I did which I'm, I'm sure are, you know, pretty unique to my bike. But, you know, again, nobody else has gone through this that I've seen yet. And so I, I wanted to throw my hat in the ring. And that's what's different about this video and why I wanted to get it out there for people. Um, like I say, got any questions, leave them in the comments. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about the project. And with that in mind, hope it was helpful, guys. Like and subscribe. Like I said, this is probably not m along my normal route of vlogging, but you know, I hope it was helpful. I'll talk to you later.